Okay, so moving on to our final speaker for the session, um, that's Suzanne Froskio, who's going to talk about risk assessment for use of recycled water containing microcystins. Thanks, Rita. Um, so I work at uh, SA Health in uh, South Australia, so um, in the Water Quality Unit, uh, along with my colleagues uh, David Cunliffe, who many of you know, um, Nat Bolton, um, and Michelle Whitholt is from our wastewater section. Um, and the other co-author uh, on this presentation is Gretchen Marshall um, from SA Water, who has provided us with all of the data on um, the microcystis levels and microcystin micro toxin levels in the in the wastewater lagoons or the recycled water. Um, so I should say, um, so at SA Health we do have a regulatory role, however we do work quite closely with SA Water, the utility, and that allows us I guess to work together um, on incident response protocols um, and, and to develop those, those responses and risk assessments together. So in South Australia uh, we have a number of wastewater treatment plants um, in the regions. Um, and they have approvals to use the recycled water for various applications. Now, the regional sites um, have fairly basic treatment on site, so you have primary and secondary treatment, and then they often, well, they, all the ones that we're talking about today use lagoons as part of the treatment process. Um, the product water isn't the highest quality product water. Um, they are um, allowed to use, they, they are approved to use the, the product water for restricted irrigation conditions. So um, restricted irrigation means that you can, you can irrigate, say, a golf course um, at night time when no one's present, um, and those restrictions on the irrigation protect the, the user against the microbial risk in that product water, so protection against, um, so there's a control protection against pathogen risk. Um, and that's in line with the um, Australian guidelines for water recycling, those sorts of control measures. But what they don't do, and I guess what's not considered um, um, in, in the restricted irrigation is that um, the, the lagoons can actually contain, a lot of the time they can contain very high levels of cyanobacteria um, and high levels of toxin. So we know the lagoons are prone to the blooms over the summer period and um, the, the blooms can last for extended periods, so we're talking like three or six months and contain high levels of toxin. So SA Health and, um, and SA Water have a incident uh, reporting relationship where high levels of cyanobacteria or toxins are reported to the health department and then we liaise with SA Water to manage the incident and ensure that there's no public, adverse public health outcomes. So this is just um, an example of one of the sites. Um, uh, so this, the sewage comes in and we'd have primary and secondary treatment. So there's a, a tank here, some, so uh, there'd be some just, uh, digestion of the, the sewage. Um, and then we go through a series of lagoons um, for detention and, and further treatment. Um, most of the sites will actually have, in fact all of the sites have a, a chlorine dosing station, um, which is on the, on the offtake. Um, where the supply goes to the to the end use. Um, what you find once you have a cyanobacterial bloom um, with that biomass, the chlorine actually becomes ineffective, like it's not really reducing the cell numbers or, or the toxin content. Um, in, in this example, this is one of the sites which actually goes to a golf course, um, and it's this, this site here is actually along one of the sites along the River Murray. So again, just an example of the wastewater lagoons with a microcystis um, bloom. Um, and this is five years worth of, of, of data for one of the sites which has been provided by SA Water. So what we're seeing here is that every year, so there's five summers here, so every year we're actually getting a bloom in the summer. Um, the green is indicating, so th these are microcystis, just, just the microcystis data. Um, the green is microcystis floss. Acqui, yep, and the, the blue lines indicating um, microcystis aeruginosa. Um, the red crosses are indicating, indicating the presence of toxins. So every year we have a bloom, um, every year there's toxin present um, to varying degree, 
Um, the blooms are lasting, so um, this is five years ago, but we're sort of starting the bloom at the beginning of summer and we're going through summer and autumn having high levels of cell numbers. Um, the last couple of years we did notice in the last two years the bloom started quite late in the season, so um, it wasn't until the end of summer, sort of February, March, that we're actually getting an increase in cell numbers and those cell numbers were sticking around until sort of May, May June in the lagoons. Now, um, this is, this is um, the sampling data. Um, you will notice that some of, the, some of the results are actually really, really high, so we were up to 16 million cells per mil here. This is, so a couple of years ago, SA water was just basically grab sampling from the lagoon, um, and that obviously depended on which way the wind was blowing to whether you were actually grabbing some scum in that sample or not. Um, what they've done in the last couple of years is they've changed their sampling routine. So we get them, to, they actually pump the sample water out for quite a few minutes before they take that sample and it just becomes a bit more representative of all, what we're actually supplying to the recycled water use. Um, I did leave them these all the points in there because it actually does sort of represent what um, numbers are being reported to SA Health and they're the kind of numbers that we need to make the decisions on. Um, in terms of toxin analysis, um, you can see some of these numbers are really quite high. So we're 100, over 100 microgram per litre of toxin, um, 300, 400 micrograms per litre of, of um, microcystin. So if we look at, um, this is just the, the latest incident we had over the last summer. Um, the first notification that we had um, for this site here, um, 120,000 cells per, per mil of microcystis originosa was reported to us at Health. Um, we thought, okay, sort of rough calculations, you might have 20 microgram per litre um, of microcystin there. Um, requested the toxin analysis on the sample and it came back at, back at 378 micrograms per litre. Um, having said that, there's probably the, lag, the time delay between actually the first sample being taken and the second sample, which was the toxin analysis was done, was probably be about um, two weeks. So once we know there's a problem, we're sampling a lot more frequently and the turnaround time for the sample analysis can be ramped up as well. Um, so luckily for this one, the, the next lot of samples, we're starting to see um, uh, uh, the cell numbers and the toxin levels are actually on the way down. So because of this issue, we're routinely seeing this every summer, um, high levels of cyanobacteria, high levels of toxin and, um, and the need to make decisions quite quickly. Uh, we, sat, we looked again at our, and updated our risk assessment for microcystin in the recycled waters. Um, we had a look at all the different sites that there are and, with, and the, um, their intended end use or the discharge point. So the categories we looked at um, or that we have include environmental discharge, um, agricultural usage, so irrigation of pasture, um, municipal irrigation, which includes your golf courses and public parks, um, and then also irrigation of commercial food crops. Um, we looked at the potential routes of human exposure um, and the on-site preventative measures, the existing ones, and whether we needed to implement, implement any um, further measures to protect public health. Um, so firstly for environmental discharge, so this will be an incident raised due to the presence of cyanobacteria toxins in product water which is being discharged to the environment. I should say this is not um, the desired um, outcome, so um, the main aim is to, um, to have 100% recycling of, of your water and, and avoid the discharges, but in some cases this still does occur, um, and particularly probably a number, so probably more than five years ago this was occurring a bit more routinely. So you'd see this is one of, our, one of the sites, um, probably has treatment, um, the lagoon-based systems and the chlorine dosing, um, and just along this tree line there is a creek, a small creek, um, that would be flowing into a, um, a further water body. So for all of the categories, um, we have a tier-based structure in, in how the incidents are actually reported. Um, numbers might start looking a little bit high, but um, remember we're talking about recycled water here. Um, a type two incident we consider, well health considers a low risk to public health, so we're really just talking about the type one incidents here and, and how we manage those. Um, and in type one, we, we consider an incident that without appropriate intervention could cause a risk to human health.
So for a type one and all of our type ones, the trigger is uh, 65,000 cells per mil. Um, once we get that number, um, we request a toxin analysis. Um, for environmental discharges, the route of exposure we consider to be ingestion of contaminated water during recreational activities. So um, for each of the discharge points, we'd look at um, determining if there, there is actually potential for public contact through recreational activities and whether there is a need for signage downstream. Um, and just on these ones, on the environmental discharge note, that um, an EPA notification is also required. So the next category you have um, is agricultural use. So this would be um, cyanobacteria or toxins in product water which is being supplied for irrigation of pasture or for irrigation or discharge to areas like um, um, we have a pine plantation as well which receives water. Um, again, you can see the lagoon-based systems here um, and this would be an example of an irrigated pasture area which might have cattle or um, I think this one has sheep. So for agricultural use, um, again, we're looking at the type one, so we have the same trigger levels, level 65,000 cells per mil um, of the microcystis species, or 30, and then we request the toxin analysis for 13 micrograms per litre of toxin. Um, the rate of exposure is ingestion of irrigation water or spray. So the appropriate interventions in this case, we've already got restricted irrigation conditions, so no public access during irrigation. Um, and for the pasture sites, there'd be a four hour withholding period before you can use that site for pasture. We also require the SA um, water, once we've got the, the cell numbers or that there's toxin present, we also require that they do notify the end user that there's cyanobacteria and toxins present. So um, the feedback that we get is that what will happen is that the, um, the farm will then move his sheep, sheep obviously into a different paddock so they can't act just access that pasture area for a while. So municipal irrigation, so we're looking at product water which is supplied to, for example, a golf course. Um, we have a number of councils which use the water for irrigation of green areas. So again, the same type, type one trigger to start the incident. Again, the same route of exposure, so ingestion of the irrigation water or spray. Um, appropriate interventions, again, we're under restricted irrigation conditions, so for a golf course, it's nighttime irrigation, um, no access, no public access during the irrigation. And again, we require that the end user is notified of the presence of cyanobacteria in the water, or in the toxins in the water. Um, once we're starting to get up to really high levels of toxin, like 250 micrograms per litre, we're starting to get a little bit more about it. Um, we do request that SA Water then reminds them that there's high levels of, um, of toxin in the water and confirm that their restricted irrigation practice are practices are reinforced, so I think they have, um, the golf course I'm thinking of um, actually has, so the irrigation's between 12pm uh, and 3am, so there's a four hour period before anyone would actually be on the golf course. Um, and then finally we have a 500 microgram per litre stop irrigation level. So you'd have to start, so this is our request, then you'd need to find an alternative uh, water source. So the example um, that we showed, um, the first example that we showed that's of the golf course, which is along by the river, they actually have the ability to take water off the, off the river as well. And what they normally do is would shandy that water with the product water. So some of the water from the, from the recycled water plant is still being taken, but they're just shandying with the, the river water until the, um, the cyanobacterial levels subside. Now to put these two um, toxin sort of levels into perspective, um, ingestion of eight mil of water at 250 microgram per litre would give you be equivalent to your tolerable daily intake for microcystin, and at 500 microgram per litre, ingestion of four mil would give you the tolerable daily intake. Um, so our final category is irrigation of food crops. Um, so we have a number of sites which are supplying uh, for drip irrigation of vineyards, and we also have an, ap ap an apple orchard. Um, at one of the, well, close by one of the sites. Um, again, a similar level, similar, tr same tr trigger levels. Um, this time, the routes of exposure that we considered were either ingestion of the irrigation water or spray. 
um, and secondly, consumption of the food product where there's potential for uptake of toxin by the plants. So, so firstly, the drip irrigation um, is your on-site control. Um, no public access during irrigation, that's the control for um, in potential ingestion of spray. Um, what we had a look at this time, we reviewed the literature on uptake of microcystins into plants and there are a number of studies um, which are published only just recently in the last couple of years which show microcystin accumulation in plant tissue. So, so there, there are several studies indicating that the toxin uptake of the toxin can actually occur via the root system. So the studies were actually showing that whether it was spray irrigation or drip irrigation, they were getting the same uptake. It was mainly in leafy greens and um, root vegetables, so things like carrots. Um, and in fact, some of the EDIs or the estimated daily intakes were above the tolerable daily intake level. So there's limited information on the uptake into fruit. So I think we found two studies looking at uptake into tomato plants. One showed no uptake and the second one showing some uptake in in some of the samples, so we couldn't exclude fruits from that. Um, whether it can be taken up into a plant which is a raised crop like grapes are, um, is another question, I guess, but what we've done at this stage is we've introduced a, um, a stop irrigation level, 100 micrograms per litre, micrograms per litre of, um, of microcystin as a precautionary measure. So um, in summary, that's the first time that um, that information was new to us and that's the first time that we've actually introduced a stop irrigation uh, for food crops. Um, I believe at one of the site, this site um, that supplies the vineyard, they're already um, proactive in, uh, they, they dose the blooms often with um, percarbonate. Um, so we have that one in and we've had the stop irrigation level on the golf course for a number of years and like I said they can they have the option of shanding their water but I guess the stop irrigation levels um, um, defining those actually um, give SA water I guess um, advanced warning of how they're going to manage those stop supply or the, the supply interruptions from their recycled water plants. So I guess what I've shown is a very um, a shortened view of, of our entire risk assessment. Um, so what we've done for each of the sites, so some of the sites actually have multiple uses, so they either go to uh, irrigation of a food crop and there might be emergency, manage, um, emergency irrigation paddock or they have an environmental discharge point as well. So we're developing a risk assessment on each of the endpoints for each site, so um, it's quite a large job. But I guess what, what this um, incident response guide is intended to provide is allow um, SA Health and SA Water have all the information on hand so that we can readily ac access the information um, for our incident management, um, incident management process and make an informed decision. And that's it. So thank you. Um, that's coming from the Australian Guidelines for Water Recycling. Oh, yeah, so a four-hour withholding period before there's access to the site. But originally... Um, I don't know the original oh. papers, yeah. Um, okay, so with that, um, that concludes our session for today. So thank you very much. Thank you.